Good morning, church family. So glad you are here. Guests, welcome to First Baptist Church of Millington, where we exist to glorify God by surrendering to him and to the growth of his kingdom. I'm so thankful that everybody is here in person, online, watching um, from our website and wherever you can watch from the internet. So I'm excited to worship. We have a couple announcements and then and we'll dive into further worship. So one, uh uh-oh, I dropped it, is our MPAA from Millington. That is our Millington Performance Art Academy that is starting. The deadline to be a part of this school is tomorrow, the 18th. And I really encourage, if you are interested at all in learning how to play an instrument of some kind, please pick up one of these packets, look at it, talk to Dave. Davis, um, he would be more than happy to dive into that for you because this school is equipping and preparing the, the church for future like worship leaders, worship um, way they can play instruments and help lead worship. So that's an exciting thing with the gospel being a focus. So the deadline is tomorrow. The second thing, and I want to read scripture to help me emphasize this point, is giving. I think of 2 Corinthians 9, 7, where it says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I just want to remind us and help us understand and love the idea of giving because it is a form of worship. It is, it's said right there in scripture, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So as you give today, just cherish this form of worship. Be excited, be cheerful when we can give. And for those of you who aren't familiar with giving, that is the reason we give. It is a form of worship to our God. He has given us everything we have have, and we're just giving back a little. So we worship him in that way. Second thing, go back to my notes, are the connect card. In front of you, you have a connect card that looks like this. We would love to get to know you. We would love to know how we can minister to you. So if this is your first time, if this is the hundredth time you've been here, please fill out one of these cards. Let us know how we can pray and love you well. Last but certainly not least, our children's ministry is leaving today for kids camp. So we're excited for them to go. We want to pray for them and for the leaders and for God to move. So for this week, if you need something to add to your prayer list, know our children are going to Kentucky to learn more about God and have a lot of fun. So with all those being said, let's pray and um, dive into worship a little more, all right? Heavenly Father, you are so good. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the things that are going on like kids camp. Lord, I pray for the leaders. I pray for the students. I pray that it's a time that they remember how much fun it was, but more importantly, that they learn who you are. They hear the gospel and they want a relationship with you. So God, bless children's camp. Bless this church time where we get to worship you because you are worthy of worshiping. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Will you stand with me as we lift our voices and proclaim his name today? I believe in the Son. I believe in the risen one. I believe I
There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand in our forgiveness. Sing it, church. Jesus is alive. Amen. Are you excited about that this morning? Lift your voices. There's a reason why. There's a reason why we sing up through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Let's lift our voices in praise every day, church. Praise the King. that he's alive this morning. Church, I hope you are. I hope you're excited about what Jesus did for us. And today we get again. It is such an exciting time for me and such a privilege to direct our attention to the baptistry every week. I think this is three, four, five weeks in a row we've seen someone baptized in the life of our church. 
And I'm telling you, it is exciting. So church, let's celebrate together as we direct our attention to the baptistry. Well, good morning, church. So you're already standing. I was gonna say, if you're not, if you'd stand and participating in worship and baptistry and celebrating Miss Abby Porter that is coming this morning. Well, guys, I kinda wanna tell a short story this morning. It started maybe about 10 or 11 years ago when you have two God-fearing parents that bring their daughter here at FBC to dedicate their little girl to the Lord. And after that day, they raised her in the scriptures. They're reading her the Bible, they're praying with her. And on the side here at FBC in our nursery, you have teachers week in and week out that invest spiritually into Miss Abby. So learning from whenever she starts to walk and talk and sing to the Lord, and after five or six years, when she swaps wings over to the children's wing, she goes through first grade, second grade, third, fourth, and fifth. And all those scriptures, all that time and effort and prayer and sweat and tears and love, it culminates right here, right now, into this baptistry. Now, Paul tells us in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And God used his word throughout the years to provide faith in Miss Abby. And today she's coming to proclaim Jesus as Lord to everybody. So Miss Abby, is it your public proclamation that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life? Amen. Well, based off your profession, I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me pray for us, church. God, you don't have to save a soul, but you do. And you use us, God, to teach, to invest, God, to love, to be your arms and feet. God, and we get to see miracles before our eyes and just see what you can do. God, and we thank you that we get to see another miracle today in the baptistry. Another soul saved that is coming to walk in obedience. God, we praise you for that. God, we thank you that your hand is on FBC and that you're moving. God, and we get to be a part of it and we get to witness it. So God, today, on this July day, here as we worship you in this room, God, I pray that you would continue to move. Move in our hearts as we worship you through song. God, as we hear your word proclaimed. God, may you do what only you can do this day. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
I know for for many of you that was a for many of you that was a brand new song. And so I want to sing that chorus again. And that first line said, I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I don't know what you walked in here with this morning, but I'm telling you right now, I may not know what it is, I don't understand it. I may never experience, I may have before, but I know one thing for sure, you do not have to walk out those doors with what you walked in here with this morning. You have to do one thing though, you have to run to the Father. You have to fall into grace. You can't hide it and you can't wait. You've got to give it to Him. And throughout our life, we will do that again and again and again. And that's the beauty of His grace. So even if you didn't know any other part of that song, I want you to sing this chorus with me. Run to the Father and fall into His grace. Run to the Father Fall in the grace, done with the hiding, reason the way. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend, so I run to the Father again. Sing it again. I run to the Father, I fall in the grace, I'm done with the hiding, reason the way. My heart found a surgeon. Church, you can be seated for just a moment. We've sung this morning about eternity. We've sung this morning that Jesus is alive and the hope that we have in Him. And that's exciting because it, it because of what Jesus did for us, we know that this isn't the end. We know that there's so much more to come as we reach eternity. And one of the things that is so exciting to me as I read through scripture and passages like Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah gets just a glimpse into heaven. He sees what's happening around the throne of God and there's angels singing to one another and they're singing a song or they're proclaiming to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And you go over to Revelation chapter five in the New Testament where John is writing about his revelation of being able to see into glory and and he's also writing that there's angels around the throne of God saying that he is worthy. So church, as we stand, as we sang earlier, as we stand as the saints of God and we proclaim his praise, we are beginning the song now that we will sing forever in eternity that he is holy and he is worthy, that he's faithful and that he's good. So I wanna read a passage to you from that Revelation chapter five, verses 11 through 13. And then the choir is going to sing about it. It says this, John's writing, he says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. And the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them were myriads of myriads, thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and power and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven, which is on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
I can't wait for eternity Join the song they're already singing Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord Just bow down before your throne See your face, I cry out because you're holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Jesus, King of kings. Jesus,
And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you are worthy, worthy, worthy of all worship, honor, and praise. And I thank you for that reminder today through song. Father, I thank you that you sit on your throne and you have no equal, you have no match. And your son, oh Lord Jesus, we thank you that you sit at the right hand of the Father in glory, making intercession for we who are your children. We say thank you, thank you, thank you. We are in awe of you. And we thank you, God the Spirit, that you have come to live within us who are your children. That we are now the address of the living God. Oh God, help us to grasp the enormity of that truth today. And Lord God, as we open your perfect and inerrant word, we ask that you would teach us today, that you would reveal yourself to us today and reveal your truth to us. Whether someone is struggling with a relationship, I pray that you would guide them and direct them in that. Someone's dealing with a health issue, I pray, Lord God, that you would remind them that you love them beyond measure and your grace is sufficient. And I pray you would be so kind to heal people of their physical ailments. We know that we, you can, we ask that you will. Lord God, whatever burdens, whatever hardships have been brought into this place today, I pray, Lord God, that everyone would leave in victory and leave in freedom because of your goodness and grace. This is our prayer. And we pray it in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. There was a church that was looking for a new senior pastor and a man got word of that and so he submitted his resume for the position. And as he submitted his resume for the position, he also sent a letter And it said, committee, understanding that you're in need of a pastor, I'd like to submit my resume. I am generally considered to be a good preacher, and I've been a leader in most places where I've served, and I've also found some time to do some writing. He says, I'm over 50 years of age. My health is not very good. Still, I manage to get the work done to where the sheep consider themselves pleased. As for references, he writes, I'm somewhat handicapped here. I've never preached anywhere longer than three years, and the churches where I have served have been rather small, yet they've been in very highly populated places. In those cases where I've served at these churches, I have had conflict with others in the area, and so many times I've had to leave due to that conflict. He goes on to say, I've even been physically attacked and I do need to make you aware that that I've spent multiple times in the local jail. The committee hears this and they're aghast and they said, who in the world would think that we would consider a man like that to be our pastor? And so they asked the chairman of the committee, who wrote that? And he says, all I can tell you is it's signed Paul. And if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, he never stayed anywhere longer than three years. And every place he seemed to go, there was conflict. He ended up in prison many a times. He was beaten many of times. He caused multiple riots. Couldn't see very well, but oh, could he write? For God used the Apostle Paul to write half of the New Testament and to plant church after church after church. And the same Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians. 
He wrote a letter to the churches in the region of Galatia. And I'm going to ask you now to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. If you're visiting with us, we are going verse by verse through this New Testament letter. And we have made our way to chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 11 through 21 today. The Apostle Paul was inspired of the Holy Spirit to write these words to these Christians in this region of Galatia that is, uh, Galatia is modern day Iraq. It doesn't cover the entire country of modern day Iraq, but the region of Galatia would be a portion of Iraq. We believe the southern portion of it. There, Paul on his first missionary journey due to physical ailments, and we don't know exactly what they were. Many speculate it was blindness, but it could have been something else. But for whatever that physical ailment was, it took him to Galatia on a detour and then to stop in that region. And when he stopped in that region, region, he led many to Christ. And so in those various cities, churches were started due to Paul using, uh, God using Paul to lead many to faith in Christ. And so he visited with them, he discipled them, he equipped them, and then it was time to move on. And now he's writing to those people uh, that many of which he led personally to faith in Jesus Christ. Now in the message today, in the verses we cover today, he has been rebuking them quite strongly for adding to the gospel. And in these verses, we find him connecting with them relationally reminding them of how much they demonstrated love to him when he was among them, trying to build that rapport with them again that's been severed through them adding to the gospel. The title of the message today is Argument 5, The Relational Argument. The Relational Argument. Again, he's going to appeal to his relationship with them to try to get their attention to repent of adding to the gospel and return to right standing with the Lord. In chapters 3 and 4 of Galatians, there's been six, there are six arguments, and we're on the fifth one. And the arguments are basically Paul telling the Galatians that the law that came 600 years after Abraham is not superior to the promise God gave to Abraham. That the promise is actually superior to the law. And that promise is, is that Abraham and his descendants, all who are children of faith that place their faith in the Lord, will receive eternal life. Abraham believed and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And now all who follow in Abraham by placing faith in the Lord, it's reckoned to us as righteousness as well. And so now he's given those first four arguments in this fifth one. He's trying to build the rapport back with them. He's trying to reconcile with them. Before I read the text, I want to just remind everyone of why this is an issue in the region of Galatia. Paul left, people came in from Jerusalem to the area and said, yes, what the apostle Paul taught you about Jesus is accurate. You need to place your faith in Jesus Christ to be saved, but you also have to uphold the law. Well, that was news to Gentiles. So now the Gentiles that were saved and baptized are now being told they got to follow the Jewish law and it's causing dissension and division in the churches of Galatia. The, some of the Jews, however, are liking it because it's saying, hey, you Gentiles, you need to be Jews first and then you can be Christians. You need to follow the law and then you need to believe in Jesus. And so they were beginning to promote that same false gospel that it's not just by faith in Jesus alone, but it's faith and works. And so Paul is writing to rebuke that false teaching, that the gospel itself is enough, and that when you add to the gospel, you don't free people, you put them back in bondage. Uh, because if you're finding your works to give you uh, your self-esteem, then you're always going to feel frustrated because you can't ever do enough. But it's not found in what you do, it's found in who you know. That's how you're made right with God. So now let's read what Paul writes to these friends of his that have now distorted the gospel. If you'll join with me for the reading of God's word, Galatians chapter four, and I'll be reading verses 11 through 20. Paul writes, I beg you brethren, 
excuse me, let me back up to verse 11. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. I beg you, brethren, become as I am. For I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you you would have plucked your eyes and given them to me. Verse 16, so I have become your enemy by telling you the truth. They eagerly seek you. Not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I am present with you, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. This is the word of the living God. God bless you. You may be seated. So again, prior to these verses here, Paul has spent multiple chapters rebuking them, saying you you are proclaiming a different gospel, which is really not the gospel at all. He's rebuked them and he's shown them how the law is not superior to Abraham and the promise to Abraham. Now he's appealing to them according to their history together. He wants them to remember when they ministered to him, when they demonstrated love to him, because right now he senses they're very hostile toward him because he is calling out them adding to the gospel. So number one, the pursuit of reconciliation. The pursuit of reconciliation. Verse 12 says, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. Paul is now letting them know, look, I don't have a problem with you personally. I have a problem with the the so-called gospel that you are distorting, and that's got to stop. But I I don't have animosity against you personally. I consider you my children. I love you. My beef is not with you as a people. My beef is simply with the the distortion of the gospel. This is important because Paul's saying, I care about you. I love you. I don't have a problem with you. We just got to address this issue. And I'm speaking about this issue of the gospel because I love you. I care for you. Our society has got to learn this again. That when you speak truth to someone, you must do so. But that doesn't mean you alienate yourself from them. That you hate them. You hate what they're saying. You hate what they're doing. You hate what they're believing. But you don't hate them. And it doesn't have to be a source of division. And he senses now that after he's rebuked them through four and a half chapters that, hey, they might think I don't love them. So I'm going to let them know I do. And he says, my problem's not with you. I care for you. I love you. That's what he's saying in verse 12. Paul understood that you have to balance rebuke and love. You have to balance discipline and grace. Parents, we know this full well. Because if you're all about saying I love you and all that grace and there's no discipline in the home, then you're going to have problems. It's going to count, it's going to catch up with you. Because you're not teaching your children the way they should go. But if you got got all discipline and all rebuke and you never compliment and you de- never demonstrate compassion, you never demonstrate love, you got problems too. There's got to be a balance between the two. And God the Father demonstrates that balance with me. And if you're a believer, he demonstrates that balance with you. We've got a good, good father. I can go sit on his lap, so to speak, and be in his presence, and he loves me unconditionally. But I cannot go out and do whatever I want and him be pleased with me. That's not what a loving father does. And so here, Paul is letting them know what you've done is wrong in distorting the gospel, but I love 
you. Don't be one that says, yes, I love my child, but my child's gone so wayward, I I can't stand to be around them. No, you ought to be seeking to reconcile them to God first and you second. Don't give up on them. Don't condone sin, but don't give up on seeking reconciliation. It's not one or the other, it's both and. And Paul is demonstrating that. He's rebuking their beliefs, he's rebuking their behavior, but he's not saying you have no value because of the decisions you have made. He realizes they were created by God, they have value. And God has a purpose and a plan that he wants to see lived out in their lives. So you and I must practice this with those that have gone wavered, wayward. We cannot compromise truth, but we can love them with God's truth. And may we do so. Second, Paul addresses their past relationship. He pursues to reconcile with them, connect with them. And now he speaks to their past relationship. First, he remembers the, the, their kindness to him. Verses 13 and 14. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was, I, I preached, excuse me, that which was a trial in you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. This is a profound statement he's saying to them. See, Paul never intended to end up in Galatia, but God orchestrated providentially for him to be there due to his physical ailment at the time. And when he got there, his appearance must have been so bad that they could have said, I don't want anything to do with him. But they did not loathe him. They did not uh, distance themselves from him, but instead they loved him. They treated him like an angel of God. And he says, even like Jesus himself. What a testimony of their hospitality, of their love, of their grace for a man they didn't know when he first got there. And they ministered to him physically and he shared the gospel with them which led to their spiritual well-being and them being made alive into Christ and forever saved and receiving the free gift of eternal life. So both were benefited from this connection Paul had with the Galatian people. He preached the gospel there the first time to them. As he was enduring that bodily condition that was hard to even look at, whatever it was. And so we need to ask ourselves, can the same be said of you that Paul says of the Galatians? Can the same be said? Are you showing hospitality to others? Are you showing kindness to others? Are you making time to minister to others? Others that don't necessarily have the same beliefs as you. Because when Paul shows up, they do not know Jesus. He tells them of Jesus. And so as they are ministering to him, he is nothing more than a stranger that has come to Galatia. Do we have that same heart today? I'm reminded of the text in Matthew where Jesus says, When you fed one of the least of these, you fed me. When you gave one of the least of these something to drink, you gave me a drink. When you clothed one of the least of these, you did it unto me. And obviously I'm paraphrasing that text. Are you demonstrating love for people? The love of Christ. Paul remembers their kindness to them. Now he's reminding them of it because they're not showing the same kindness to him now. They've changed. This brings us to the second truth he shares here. He recalls their loyalty to him. Verses 15 and 16. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? That right there is a statement. You you folks have changed, right? You You were a blessing. It's not there now. Where's it gone? Then he says, for I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. That's why we think he's referencing that he's having a issue with blindness. All right, we we do know from other texts that he struggled with sight. And here he's saying, y'all would have given me your eyes if you could have for me to see. That's how most interpret that. You would have plucked out your eyes for me. Verse 16, so I have become your enemy by telling you the truth. I believe many of you have been there 
in my life, I've been on both ends of this. I've been on the end where I have told someone the truth and it wasn't well received. And I did it out of love. And that's what Paul's doing. I, am I now your enemy for telling you the truth? But I've also been on the end, like the Galatians, where someone's told me the truth. I wasn't real happy about hearing it. How about you? So before we get too harsh and hard on the Galatians, let's realize we have been the Galatians, each of us, at some point of time. He recalls their loyalty to him, and it's now changed. He's gone from the one they would have plucked out their eyes for to now an enemy because he's simply telling them, do not add to the gospel. Folks, we've got to protect the true gospel. We can't add to it. We can't take away from it. And many in Christianity are adding and taking away from it. There's some saying you can be a Christian simply by following Christ's example that he didn't have to die on the cross. That's not the gospel, but they'll call themselves Christians. Others will say you've got to believe in Jesus, but you've got to be baptized. You've got to believe in Jesus, you've got to join a church. You've got to be baptized. You've got to, you've got to be a Christian, but you also got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. That's adding to the gospel. You've got to, you've got to be a Christian, but you've got to receive the Spirit later. That, that's all distortions of the gospel. We've got to protect the true gospel, and the true gospel is narrow. It's particular. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to the Father except through him. These kind people that treated Paul like he was the Lord Jesus himself are now hard-hearted and distant they, they teach us that even we as Christians, if we don't stay fixed on Jesus, we can go from having the joy of our salvation to being hardened toward the truth. Hardened toward fellow Christians that care about us, that are trying to lead us to repent. Are you there today? Can you relate to the Galatians? Let's do some introspection for just a moment. Have you lost the joy of your salvation? Were you more passionate about Jesus when he saved your soul than you are today? Are you more burdened for lost people? And the fact that if they die, they're going to hell. Are you more burdened about that today or less than in the past? Have you become hardened to the truth? Do you resent fellow Christians that in private and in love speak into your life? might be a teenager you might be an adult child and you're just sick and tired of the parents nagging at you stop and ask is it nagging because it might just be okay sometimes it is just being difficult but is there any truth in what they're saying What about someone here in the church that cares deeply about you and sees that you once had joy and you no longer are demonstrating that joy? You once served, but you no longer serve. You once were happy, but now you seem bitter. Can they speak into your life and you be thankful? That's what Paul's trying to say. I'm telling you, Galatians, the truth. Be thankful. Don't consider me an enemy for telling you the truth. So today, do you need to repent, believer, of apathy? Do you need to repent of complacency? Do you need to repent of distancing yourself from those that will speak truth into your life? We need one another. We need accountability from one another. We need encouragement, but we need someone that's also going to take us aside and say, you used to be like this. What's going on? Because I'm not seeing it anymore. That's grace. That's what the church is for. We are to care one for another. You know, we go out of our way to try to avoid pain of any sort. William the Refrigerator Perry, anybody know that name? My generation and older will. Uh, 1985 defensive tackle for the Chicago Bears they won the Super Bowl but he would also be given the ball to run it up the middle 
330, 40 pounds, anybody that got in his way suffered for it, okay, as he just bulldozed right over them into the end zone. Well, the story is he retired from football and for 15 or so years, he didn't go to the dentist. You know why? He was terrified. He was scared. Had the money, just wouldn't go. Got so bad that he would pull his own teeth out, but he would not go to the dentist. Got so bad that his gums got infected, but he wouldn't go to the dentist. By the time he finally went to the dentist, uh, half his teeth were gone, and the other half had to be pulled out. They had to put a bracket in and put in false uh, teeth all across because he had not taken care of his teeth because of what? He was scared. He didn't want any pain. He didn't want to hurt. And he even endured a great amount of pain, but he thought it would be better if he dealt with it himself than go to the dentist. He wouldn't let the dentist help him, is the point. And the dentist here in the room are probably thinking, I went to school to help people with that. <laughs> but he tried to take care of it himself. And the sad story is he has none of his teeth now. Let us learn from that. Don't live your life trying to avoid pain or someone confronting you or hardship or you confronting someone. Walk with Jesus and just obey his word. You know, there's not a person in the Bible that didn't have heartache. There's not a person in the Bible, Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jesus, doesn't matter who it is. There's not one that did not have hardship. We're not going to be able to avoid it. So don't try to. Fix your eyes on Jesus and do what he says to do. Live for him. Honor him. Listen to people that speak truth into your life. Consider if it's truth. Let me be honest with you. I have to speak in general terms here because some people in my life, I'm a pastor if you hadn't checked, noticed that, and, and a lot of people have a lot of ideas to share with me. Okay, and, and people have things where the Lord has told them, Pastor, you are to do this. Okay, and so I listen, and then I've got to not just dismiss it, I've got to take it to the Lord and say, Lord, do you want this done? The idea didn't start with me, it started with someone else. Okay, sometimes the Lord has confirmed, I sent that person to you, I want you to do what was said. Other times, now's not the right time for that. I've gotten both answers from the Lord through prayer. But I didn't just dismiss what was said. Y'all with me? So you, when someone speaks truth in your life, they don't know all that's going on. Take it in, take it to the Lord, and see what he wants you to do with that information. And it might be that half of it, dismiss. But the other half, he wants you to act upon and take to heart, confess sin due to it, whatever it is. Listen to others. Let them take the good, throw out the bad, so to speak, and let God do a work in your life. Number three now, his current instruction. His current instruction. Now he's going to talk again, talk some about these false teachers that have deceived him. So first, he warns regarding the false teachers, verses 17 and 18. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them but it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner and not only when I am present with you. You can always count on a false teacher being a false teacher because he's trying to attract people to himself. Take this to heart. He's trying to attract people not to Jesus but to himself. And we see this in many different forms. All right, notice what Paul wrote there. He said, they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. Leaders of cults have been known for this. They gather a following that will do exactly what the cult leader tells them to do. 
Why are they doing that? They'll say it's for the Lord, but it's really for their following. It's for their ego. It's for their power. It's for their influence. But we also see this not just in cults. We see this among parachurch organization leaders sometimes. There are some organizations in the name of Jesus that are harming the local church. They'll draw people into their organization, and their organization takes the place of the church. Be careful. Upon this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Any ministry is to be building up his church because that's where God's at work. God is building his church through his church, and then he can use parachurch organizations as an extension to build up the church. If a parachurch organization's hurting the church, you need to run. You need to run. They are never to replace the church. You can never say, hey, I go to this Bible study with this organization. Well, where do you go to church? I go to this Bible study. Uh Uh-uh. The Lord is building his church. They are to build up the church. They are to be an extension of the church. They are to be accountable to a local church. We also see this in other forms. Sometimes there are pastors of local churches that are more concerned with his own following than people following the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he gets so big and he has a failure, people just leave the church in droves because they weren't there for the Lord. They were there as his followers. That is unhealthy and it's harmful to the kingdom of God. They wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. I had a relative over in the South Carolina, North Carolina area, and her husband passed away, and so she became a widow. And within two weeks of his passing, she got a phone call from an organization of a televangelist. And the representative of that ministry said, ma'am, we are so sorry for your loss Our ministry has been praying for you, and the Lord has revealed to our leader, and and the person said the televangelist's name, the Lord has told our leader that the Lord wants you to give $10,000 to his ministry. That organization was not promoting the Lord Jesus. That organization was promoting getting her money. What's it say right here? They wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. Here is a lady in mourning. Possibly her husband's been handling the finances. And now he's not there. She's overwhelmed with the loss of her husband. And here is a phone call saying, we care for you. But they don't. Be careful. Be careful. Beware of people that make money by stirring up strife. There is a new way. The Bible talks about false teachers entering the church, but in our day, they don't have to enter the church physically. They can enter the church through a Bible study video that distorts truth. They can enter the church through their radio ministry. They can enter the church through television. They can enter the church through... through, uh, radio. They can enter the church through podcasts. That's the new way. And there around Southern Baptist Convention time, I had a lot of questions from people because they were listening to podcasts of people that make money from division. If there's no division in the Southern Baptist Convention, they've got nothing to talk about and they're out of a job. They have no followers. They make their money off strife. They make their money off drama. And they're infiltrating the church. Be careful. Beware. Beware. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 and 30 says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, 
Check this out. After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. In Acts chapter 20, Paul's writing to the Ephesian pastors. The ones leading the church in Ephesus. He's saying, after I leave, there's going to be people come in and try to lead people astray. But today, they don't have to come in the building to do so. They can lead you astray in many ways without them even living within 100 miles of you. Be careful. What I'm about to say is self-serving, but it is true. And I'm going to say it in two ways. One, God has not called me to be the shepherd to the people in Ripley, Tennessee. God has not called you or called anyone other than your pastors here to be your shepherds. Let me say that again. God has not called anyone other than your pastors here at First Baptist to be your shepherds. Now that's self-serving. It's promoting the pastors here, myself included, but it's truth. God has not called a radio evangelist living in California to be your pastor. He's not called the guy doing the podcast from Chicago to be your pastor. And so, with a growing trend today that pastors are dealing with is, yeah, but so-and-so on the radio said it. So-and-so in the podcast said it. Well, stop listening to them then. Because God set it up for you to be fed in this environment that we're in right now. This is your primary feeding And then you feed yourself through the week, come back on Wednesday night, be in life group. There are many ways to be fed God's word. There's other Bible studies during the week. But here, your church is providing multiple ways for you to be poured into. Podcasts are fine. Listening to other preachers is fine. Just depends on who it is. Be careful. Beware. Don't be distorted Because the Galatians, when Paul left, what happened? They listened to others, and they got led astray. Proverbs 27, 6 says this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. I don't like wounds, but I sure do like them coming from someone that cares for me, a friend. They're going to come, I want them to come from a friend, someone that cares about me. A true servant leader does not use people to build up himself. He serves and he leads them to know and glorify Christ. That's why our mission statement is we exist to glorify God by surrendering to him and to the growth of his kingdom. It is his kingdom, not yours, not mine. It is his church here at First Baptist that is to be used to grow his kingdom. This is not my church, it's not yours, it's his. And he's building it for his glory. Next, I want you to see that Paul exhorts them to mature. Verses 19 and 20. Y'all listen quickly, all right? Here we go. Fasten your seatbelts. You got them? All right, here we go. Verse 19, my children, with whom I again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you and now to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. He says, my children. That speaks of relationship. Paul is reminding them, we are Christians here, and I'm your father in the faith. I'm the one that told you of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. You are my spiritual children. Then he says the phrase, with whom I'm again in labor. That speaks of the anguish. Ladies, you know this better than I do. When he speaks of I'm in labor again, he's talking about child labor. He's laboring. He's sweating. He's, he's tired. He's exhausted. He's in anguish and pain. He is suffering over them. Their spiritual condition matters to him. And when the lady is delivering child and she's going through all the pain and the discomfort and the, the mental challenges she has through it all, it's hard. It's anguish. Right, ladies? Okay, thank you. A few have gone through it. Okay, and it's hard. And he said, I'm in anguish over you. Again, I speak and I'm I'm in labor over you. It speaks of his intensity for them. He loved them. 
He cared for them. And then we see the phrase, until Christ is formed in you. Notice what Paul's saying there. He's got an expectation. He's got an expectation. I'm laboring. I'm in anguish. I'm in prayer interceding for you until Christ is formed in you. Notice he says, in the hope that Christ will be formed in you. That's not what he says. He says, I'm going to do this until Christ is formed in you. He's got an expectation that it's going to happen as he prays and labors for them. Church, we've got to realize this. Truth is outraged by silence. Take that in. Truth is outraged by silence. If a doctor knows what could save your life and doesn't tell you, what good is it? Truth kept to yourself Truth that is silent and not shared is awful. Truth is meant to be spoken. Truth is meant to be proclaimed. Truth is meant to be fought for. Paul is telling it and he's fighting for it. The truth of the gospel. Truth is angered by silence. You and I should be broken hearted over our silence when it comes to the gospel. Truth is to be shared. The truth of the gospel is to be proclaimed. Not once a year, not once in a decade, regularly, weekly. It is to be told because it's the truth people need. It's the cure. They need to know how they can be rescued from their sin. And then when it comes to believer to believer, we've got to speak truth to one another in love. Typically, it needs to be in private, but we need to care enough about each other. It says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, a verse we're going to get to later. It says, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one look into yourself so that you will not be tempted. It doesn't say, hey, if another has fallen into sin, let them be. It's their problem. We're a family. We're the people of God. We care for one another. We don't yell at each other. We don't embarrass each other. But we go to one another and restore each other in a state of gentleness. God's called us to do that. That's what Paul is trying to do with the Galatians. What he's trying to tell them is, y'all have gone wayward. Return to the Lord. And so my question for you is, is, have you gone wayward? Do you need to return to the Lord? Are you more concerned about other things right now than what God has for you in this moment? Have you just wasted away this hour missing him? Or have you been zoned in to what the Spirit wants to say to you? Is Christ foremost in your life? Is he being formed in you? That speaks of maturing you in the faith. Are you maturing in the faith? Are you reading along chronologically as we journey into 1 Samuel now? If you haven't been reading with us, start at 1 Samuel and join with us. For soon, this week, we'll be going from the judges era into the kingdom era. Join with us on this journey and when you read something, you say, I don't know what's going on. Call, call someone and talk about the Word of God. That's what we're here for, to build one another up in the faith. Join in with us. Be in the Word. Let God speak to you through His Word. Is Christ foremost in your life, believer? And then second, do you know Him as Lord? Does He know you? Has he saved your soul and made you a new creature? If not today, right now, right where you're sitting, you can trust in Jesus. You can say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need of you the Savior. Forgive me. Save me. I confess you as my Lord. And he'll save your soul. If you mean that with all that you have, all that you are. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, please. 
Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul's desire to reconcile with the Galatians. We thank you for his heart to speak truth in love and to want them to be right with you. And so, Lord God, those that are not right with you, would you just give them a humble heart right now to say, God, I'm not where I should be. I ask you to forgive me, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Give me forgiveness in my heart toward another. Help me to seek reconciliation. Lord God, I pray that you would move on hearts, that people would leave here not with the burden, but leave here in victory because they've laid the burden down at your feet. I pray in a moment as we stand and sing that you would lead people to come and kneel at these steps and make these steps their altar before you, God, where they pour out their heart to you regarding an issue they're going through or the issue of another. I pray, Lord God, right now for the one that doesn't know you, that you would show them how loving and gracious you are, that Jesus, you knew no sin, but yet you took his or her sin upon yourself and went to the cross to pay their fine, to pay their debt due to their sin so that they don't have to carry their sin anymore. They can be set free. Set free to live in freedom to you. Holy Spirit, move in this place and move those people you're calling to respond. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.